So the first place that I wanted to start with is what the new DSM criteria is for ADHD. And it's significant and age inappropriate symptoms of inattention and or hyperactivity or impulsivity. Um, the onset needs to have occurred by about the age of 12 and that the symptoms have lasted for at least a period of six months or more. Um, and we really uh, need to see that there's impairment in functioning in two or more settings. Those settings either being academic, um, social, um, occupational, sports, et cetera. Um, and importantly, that the symptoms are not better accounted for by another um, psychiatric um, condition. And for adults, they need to have fewer symptoms to meet uh, criteria for ADHD. In terms of what the changes are from the previous DSM-4, the core symptoms, which are the inattention, the hyperactivity, and the impulsivity, those haven't changed. What has changed is that ADHD made the shift from what used to be called the disruptive behavior disorders, otherwise known as the naughty child syndrome, um, into neurodevelopmental disorders. And a lot of that is because of certainly both clinical and research work that has helped us to understand that ADHD is a brain condition as opposed to solely a behavioral um, disorder, but it's a brain condition that has obviously um, behavioral um, outcomes. Uh, the onset of age was raised to 12 uh, from seven. Um, there are now more examples um, provided for adolescent and adult symptoms, and probably one of the um, more important changes was that ADHD and ASD for the first time uh, could be diagnosed as co-occurring conditions. In terms of its prevalence, a lot of that depends upon what the source is. Uh, in terms of uh, rates have been listed as uh, 11 to 23 percent if you ask parents only, although rates are around 5 to 7 percent using both parent and teacher data. Uh, the inattentive symptoms are most common by parent uh, ratings, and the combined type is more prevalent if done by what we call the best diagnostic methods, and that's using both teacher and parent data. Um, so overall, we're really talking about three to seven percent of the childhood population and about four percent of the adult population. Uh, it's more commonly diagnosed in males than females in the pediatric population, that is for young kids, but about 50-50 once we reach adulthood. In terms of the core symptom areas, um, we have inattention, o overlapping or present with impulsivity, hyperactivity, uh, and restlessness. Well, what's the difference between ADD and ADHD? There is only one condition. It is ADHD, and it has different presentations. The names have sort of changed over the years as we've had a better understanding. So we really talk now about there being three presentation types, a primarily inattentive type, which is what used to be called ADD, in the old days, a combined type where a child, adolescent or adult, has symptoms of both inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity, and or restlessness, or a, another, or a third subtype where there's just kind of impulsivity, hyperactivity, restlessness. That is often the earliest presentation of ADHD, so often we see that in very young children, and the inattentive symptoms emerge as um, they move into uh, the school age range at, with uh, academics. So in terms of the course of the disorder, uh, back in the dark ages when I went to graduate school, you know, we were taught, well, ADHD is really a condition primarily of children. And by the time kids, you know, reach puberty, um, you know, their teens, you know, ADHD has really gone away. And part of the reason for that thinking was that these hyperactive symptoms actually do decrease over age for a significant number of children. So that by puberty, young adolescents, you know, kids are no longer wiggly, 
hopping up and down, you know, kind of running around the room, but they're still kind of running around in their head. So we definitely know that we see a decrease in hyperactive behavior with age to some extent for some part of the population with impulsivity as well, but one of the symptoms that, um, you know, is sort of a core symptom that carries throughout are the inattentive symptoms. So in terms of thinking a little bit about what are some of the diagnostic um, and treatment challenges for ADHD, um, one of the major ones is that what we call the heterogeneity of the presentation. You know, there is no single one way in which ADHD manifests itself. We know that we see these core symptoms of inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity, but over the um, age range, and I'll go into that next, those symptoms are di manifested differently at different times so that the presentation actually changes over time. And ADHD is one of the most highly comorbid conditions, uh, the most common ones being anxiety, depression, learning disabilities. Um, and the treatment options and the symptom presentation don't exactly match up. So the way in which um, ADHD presents itself and the treatments that we have for it, you know, don't fit together perfectly. So those are some of our challenges. Um, in terms of its developmental progression and its impact, all the symptoms don't occur all the time, which is one of the confusing things about ADHD. Um, the symptoms occur and they change in prominence over the developmental age range. So when we think of um, you know, like that preschool age range. So young kids, kind of four to six, the, the primary um, symptoms are what we call behavioral disturbance, and that's that hyperactivity, that fidgetiness, that wiggliness, that kind of running around the room. Um, and this is the British spelling. I actually didn't misspell any of those words. Behavioral is British. Um, and um, so that's what we're seeing at the youngest ages. Then when we get to school age, we can also still see that behavioral disturbance, that hyperactive um, behavior, but what also begins to kick in, because we're talking about kids who are kind of between the ages of six and 12, is that we begin to see academic impairment. So these are kids who are having trouble in school, not specifically because they're having a learning issue, although some kids can have a co-occurring learning issue, but because they're struggling with um, inattention and that's making it difficult perhaps to attend to the teacher, attend to their work, complete work. Um, they begin to have what we think of as poor social interaction or um, peer you know, rejection. Uh, so these are kids who are making friends quickly and easily, but having trouble keeping friends because they're not reading the social cues in exactly you know, the same way. And at that school age is also when we again begin to see the emergence of the co-occurring conditions. So imagine that you're you know, an eight, nine, 10 year old, you're struggling academically in school, a lot of the kids don't wanna play with you, sometimes there's the emergence of the co-occurring conditions like anxiety, depression. It's often when we begin to um, diagnose a co-occurring uh, learning um, condition. Uh, in adolescence, uh, again, one of the prominent uh, features that we see developmentally is the academic piece. Because not only do you have to attend to one teacher, you've got to attend to five teachers, and you've got five different notebooks, and you've got to like organize your work, you've got to be able to plan, you've got to work on timing. So there are many other pieces that have an impact, you know, at 13, 14, 15 that weren't demands in the environment at ages four or five. We see the poor uh, social um, interaction. Um, for many kids, the beginning of feelings of low self-esteem. So you've had you know, three, four, five years of feedback you know, from peers, from teachers, that you know, your behavior isn't matching up with other kids in your classroom or in your peer group or on your sports team. Um, and adolescence is um, a time of you know, the emergence of risky behaviors out there in the environment anyway, and kids with ADHD, because of poor decision making or perhaps impulsivity, are at greater risk for making poor decisions around initiating 
you know, smoking behavior, alcohol, use of drugs. Uh, for some kids, there might be um, the beginnings of antisocial um, behaviors, and again, then the uh, comorbidities. Um, for um, college age students, and this comes up with kids that we see clinically, academic failure, and academic failure in kids who are incredibly bright and incredibly capable, but they're struggling with coping with those you know, daily tasks, uh, activities. You know, you go away to college, suddenly you're completely and totally on your own. You get up when you feel like getting up. You go to class if you want to go to class. Nobody's taking attendance. You, um, you've got to manage a whole host of things in your environment that you d perhaps may have had more support earlier in your life to manage. So we often see the beginning of occupational difficulties, the low self-esteem, um, using alcohol and substances, perhaps to both cope with symptoms, but also because of making impulsive or um, poor decisions. Uh, and we see an increase in injuries, accidents, uh, appearances uh, at the emergency room. And then for adults, you know, it's a continuation of that. You know, the difficulty in coping with daily tasks. Um, talks about under uh, unemployment, but for many adults, a bigger issue is underemployment. So you've got, you know, a, a very bright, capable 28-year-old living in the parents' garage, delivering pizzas for Steve's Pizza, but yet they could actually own a franchise of Steve's, you know, pizzas. Um, so the low self-esteem, we uh, begin to see a lot of the relationship uh, problems, motor accidents, uh, marital difficulties, and then the continued um, difficulties, perhaps, or risk for alcohol and substance use and uh, mood instability. And for adults, I know that in our clinic, uh, three of the most common reasons that adults appear um, at our clinic, particularly ones who have never, ever been diagnosed before, the first one being that they've just had a child who's been diagnosed with ADHD and they went, oh my goodness, I had all of those same symptoms as a child. I kind of struggled in school, you know, everyone just sort of said, you know, kind of buck up, pay attention, you know, now I have an understanding of what might be going on, so they come in to um, get an assessment. Um, uh, another reason is that you've got an adult who is now um, at a place in their career where suddenly they're up for, you know, a big promotion. Now they're going to become a manager. They're going to manage a, a whole host of uh, other um, team um, uh, coworkers, and and they're going, oh my goodness, I know that I struggle with organization, with how to prioritize, with you know how to sort of manage all of the things in my environment, and. I now feel like perhaps I need to get a good diagnosis and figure out what kinds of supports I might be able to need so that I can go on and take this new career opportunity. And then the third reason is a spouse or a partner who has said, you know, there is something going on here and I really feel as though, you know, we, 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 we need to get some outside consultation. Um, ADHD has many um, comorbidities, uh, the most common being uh, the learning uh, disorders. Um, anywhere from 20 to 60 percent of kids with ADHD also have so, uh, one, one or more LDs. Um, there's a significant uh, risk of anxiety and or depression, as well as oppositional defiant disorder and conduct disorder. Um, over here, their um, uh, ADHD exists um, in the same sort of genetic uh, neighborhood as tick disorders, so that kids with um, ADHD are often at a higher risk for tick disorders.